There are astronauts and there are euphonauts. Warning, the following material may not be suitable for all audiences. Please listen responsibly. Welcome everyone to Euphonaut Radio 9 to 10 every Saturday night. Broadcasting live here from the mothership Cape Ham 860. I'm your host Jesse Randolph and as always, thank you for tuning in tonight to a program that takes you on a truth journey outside the matrix every week. Euphonaut Radio, what do we do here? We report the latest happenings within ufology, paranormal, new science, and we examine these subjects and their communities with a very high level of scrutiny together. With that being said, please put your cell on vibrate. Open your mind while we present the taboo to you that most are afraid to discuss openly during the work week. If you sense a seriousness to my voice, and if that's apparent to you, it should be. Tonight's show, as most of you know, is the ninth anniversary of the 9-11 attacks. I didn't realize at the time we had a show planned on 9-11, but fate so have it, we do. So many people are still very angry. They're hurt, dumbfounded by how this could ever have happened. So much so, many needed to take a step back and analyze. Unfortunately, it seemed at the time that our leaders were more interested in swift judgment and what I consider, as many do, an or unorganized and eventually admitted false accusation and accusations which led us down roads to warfare that proved to be of no connection whatsoever to what happened on 9-11. Tonight, we will not focus on the who. I'm telling you that right now. What I wanted to do was bring you a fresh perspective on why this subject still needs further review and investigation. I didn't want to go into the conspiracy zone here. Analogy. You want to buy a used car. You take the car to a mechanic to check it out. Makes sense, right? You want to purchase a home. You have an inspector check out the place beforehand. Makes sense? Tonight, I'm going to bring you an expert in the field of architecture and engineering that has come to the conclusion about what happened structurally in New York that do not resemble at all what the 9-11 Commission talks about. What I really want to focus the hour tonight on is what I feel is some potential smoking gun evidence, possibly, and some hypothetical theories for reopening a case that should have been transparent in totality, but was definitely not. Building 7. Does it ring a bell? Building 7. Many don't even know what Building 7 was. Well, tonight, I want to talk about Building 7, the significance it plays in this homage to the people that lost their lives on this day from my hometown and around the country, 9-11. Asking questions about 9-11 has become taboo in this country, much like ufology. You are a crackpot. You are un-American by asking questions. Please don't be intimidated to ask questions. Demand answers. Our country is based on these principles. When we stop and become afraid to speak out or inquire, we have surely changed paths. 9-11 is still very much a mystery. So the important people involved, the families, the loved ones, they are not satisfied with the investigation, hence, it should be reexamined by an actual qualified and uninfluenced political body. So, tonight, we are joined by one of the men, one of the men that I speak of. We had two ready for you. We have one here tonight. We don't need to ask for Senate hearings, my friends. We can let them stick to Roger Clemens and HGH. They're too busy. Instead, what we're going to do is let this gentleman educate us tonight and empower us on where to find more information. Youth Not Radio is privileged to be joined tonight by former NASA Flight Research Program Manager and a member of the AE 9-11 Truth Initiative, Mr. Dwayne Dietz. As we dedicate this show to the families of the lost ones on 9-11 tonight 
And we will not be afraid to ask the tough questions on their behalf. Dane Dweets coming up after the break. This is Yukonot Radio, KPAM 860. Don't go anywhere. 9 to 10 every Saturday night. Yukonot Radio with Jesse Randolph on KPAM 860. Okay, let's get into it here. We forego the news with Sandy Fleming to have more time with our guests because this is oh so important. Mr. Dane, Mr. Dwayne Dietz, excuse me, a little sensitive tonight, a retired aerospace research engineer while at NASA Dryden Flight Research Center. He held positions of Chief Research Engineering Division Director for Aeronautical Projects and, like I said, was a Flight Research Program Manager. Dwayne, welcome to the program. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you. I know you have a long day, and we're going to hear about that. But I want to jump right into some things here as we only have an hour together. So why don't you start by telling us a bit about your engineering background, but more about how you decided and why you decided to get involved with this subject, probably knowing full well that it was not something that would further both your career or your reputation by any means. Well, actually, I retired before uh, 9-11 happened, Mm -hmm. just the year before that. And I didn't really uh, become alarmed and suspicious. I kind of bought the official story at first. And long about 2006 is when I uh, really had serious doubts from my professional experience in aeronautics. I became... Uh, very suspicious about these novice pilots that supposedly flew very difficult tasks and striking the two towers. That I thought that was very difficult even for an experienced pilot mm-hmm. to pull off. And, uh, and so I just got curious and looked into it. And uh, the more I looked, I just I saw that there was just one uh, serious problem after another. And uh, I decided to look, focus more on the buildings themselves at that time because I thought it was easier to get uh, data on it. I figured it didn't have any kind of national security uh, restrictions on release of information. So I kind of changed my focus. Well, tell us a little bit about what you did at NASA so that people can understand the kind of messenger we're speaking with tonight. Well, my early career was in the field of flight control systems and developed some advanced uh, control system technology that at the time it was very new and leading edge. And now it's standard equipment like in the Boeing 777. It's called fly-by-wire, really uh, uses computers almost totally, uh, very reliable and... and, uh, redundant, so they're checking information back and forth between computers. So Understood, understood. I really kind of helped make that a, a viable way of going. Okay. Now, did you hold any security clearances while at NASA? I did. It was later in my career, and I uh, actually ended up with quite a few uh, involvements in a number of different secret Okay, so you understand uh, the protocol program. involved. Now, how did you become a member of the – it's called the AE 9-11 Truth Initiative, which stands for Architects and Engineers, folks. And I will say this before you, I let you answer. There's a personal statement by you on the site that says the following. The many visual images, massive structural members being hurled horizontally, huge pyroclastic clouds, etc., leave no doubt in my mind explosives were involved. So how did you get involved in the AE 9-11 Truth Initiative, and what is that? Well, it is, at the time that I uh, joined, there was probably 300 maybe architects or engineers with uh, professional credentials that had signed a petition calling for a new investigation. And as I became more informed on what they were doing, I I immediately uh, said to myself, uh, well, I agree with them. I mean, I I think there's all kinds of evidence that we have not been told, we, the public, have not been told correct information on this. So I I signed the petition mm-hmm. and became a little bit more involved, and 
and uh, it wasn't long until I became a member of their writing team, and uh, and I'm now the leader of the writing team for that. What is the writing team? Uh, the writing team, um, anything that goes on the website, uh, this group of people would write the material for it. Okay. And, and we get information into uh, other kind of publications as well. And the ultimate are... ultimate goal uh, being what, Dwayne, as far as for your Well, the ultimate goal is to try to explain the information more or less to the public. I mean, we have prof uh, professionals and architects and engineering field, so we have the the technically uh, the technical art articles that are directed towards that community. The writing team doesn't tend to do that. We tend to try to take that technical information and write it more for a layperson so that we can communicate to the general public. Okay, understood. So basically we're talking about a ton of quality messengers that have gotten together and said, not only do we want another investigation, but we want to solve what happened in New York specifically, correct? Uh, that's true. Plus, the third thing is we want to educate the public so they become, uh, let's say, inspired to go out and Absolutely. try to do it from there. And we're going to talk about that as well. because what I want to do t later tonight is get your opinion on where the public can go. I'll tell you this much, Dwayne. I saw a two-hour lecture from Richard Gage a few weeks ago that had me up at 4 o'clock in the morning. So I want you to educate us on where to go for more information later on in the interview. But what, let's do this. Let's get granular. And what I want to do now is educate this audience on some things they've probably never even talked about or heard about before because it wasn't presented to them on Fox News or it wasn't presented to them on CNN, which is – structural reasons for re-examining what happened in New York on 9-11. Right. And I'd like to leave out conspiracy talk like we talked about, the who and the why. So with the time we have, I think what impacted me the most about some of the recent lectures was Building 7. Can you explain to this audience what Building 7 is and why it's crucial to a reinvestigation? Right. Uh, building 7 is a 47-story building that was – about 350 yards north of the twin tower that was closest to it, which okay. is the North Tower. So it was uh, small in comparison with the 110-story twin towers, but 47 stories is is very tall. In Portland, that's north. that's huge. Yeah, it's huge, and uh, and it did not. Well, basically, it certainly didn't get struck by an airplane. So it's just there, and then late in the afternoon at 5.20 p.m., it came crashing down, and it turned out at free fall acceleration for the first two seconds of it, which uh, basically means that the structure beneath it had to immediately get out of the way uh, in some manner. There's only one logical way for structure to suddenly get out of the way. Which is? Which is with explosives. You're talking about a controlled demolition, correct? Basically. Okay. So why, explain to us what a controlled demolition is. Well, uh, the purpose for controlled demolition, and there's an industry doing this, is to remove particularly uh, high-rise buildings in a way that is safe, that does not uh, fall over to the side and endanger other buildings and other property and things like that. So it's a, a, a capability, a skill, that's almost an art form of placing explosives at the proper location so that it comes right down in its own footprint. Okay, so how does a 47-story building, and let's think about this. Visualize this with me, audience, listeners. How does a 47-story building come – crashing down, Dwayne, and it wasn't struck by anything. Was it struck by debris? Uh, the official story is that it was struck by debris, and there's no question about that. Okay. Uh, and by official story, I mean what the government agency that was uh, chartered to investigate it and what their final report says. What they say is that that debris started fires in 
Building 7. And those fires basically continued to burn and uh, be, got out of control and ended up doing damage to the structure itself. That's the official story. However, there's never been a high-rise steel frame uh, building that came down like that due to fire. So they were uh, basically saying this was the first time that ever happened. And when you say they, I always wondered, as many people have asked me, who were they? Who were these people that they empowered to be the people to come up with the official explanation? Well, the agency is called the National Institute for Standards and Technology. Okay. It's uh, basically an agency within the Department of Commerce. And we refer to it by its initials, NIST. We usually just call it NIST. So they were chartered by Congress to be the investigative uh, agency for the three World Trade Centers. So in the case of the Twin Towers, they did their report and then turned that over to the 9-11 Commission. In the case of Building 7, uh, they did not complete their study uh, at the time the 9-11 Commission did its final report. They continued for years afterwards and did not finish it until November of 2008. And uh, and that ends up being the only up, uh, report out of the government on what happened on Building 7. That the fire eventually brought these... Uh, and that's what they say, the fire brought it down. And in your opinion, that's basically impossible? Well, if if I can just mention three things that uh, kind of bring me to that conclusion. Please. I already mentioned the fact that it's never happened before in the history of high-rise buildings. That's one thing. Secondly, there was extraordinary, extraordinarily high temperatures uh, in the remains below Building 7 that persisted for weeks afterwards. These temperatures were more than 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit, higher than what NIST, said the temperatures were. And the fact that they persisted for weeks, uh, actually I think middle of December is the last report where they were starting to subside, uh, is very troubling. And if the, if the government doesn't even acknowledge that those high temperatures existed, that makes it, it further problematic. Sure. And then the third thing is there was a team of international scientists that uh, in 2008, uh, February, uh, April of 2008, they published a report in the, in the open literature examining some dust particles from ground zero. They had four different samples, and they determined that there was a, a very high-tech, uh, either a explosive or you could call it a pirate technique, depending on how it exactly it was designed. They couldn't tell exactly which it was, but let's just say it was an explosive, just to have the conversation continue. Uh, it's called nanothermite, and the nano means it's uh, extremely small, the, the nanometer size. Now, you have, to, you have to back up here because I happen to know what thermite is. I was educated. What, yep. what is thermite? Well, thermite is a combination of aluminum oxide and iron uh, that uh, can come together and form a reaction of either explosive or pyrotechnic type. Uh, but the important thing about it in this regard is it has its own... Dwayne, hang on oxide. a second. I don't want people to miss this. Okay. I want to find out why thermite might have been present at either of these sites, whether it's the Twin Towers or Building 7. And I want to get into why it seems as though that's a subject that people don't want to talk about and some have lost their jobs discussing. We'll be right back with Dwayne Dietz. This is Euphonaut Radio. What we want is transparency. It's what we deserve. It's what this country is founded on is that we are equal, and we deserve answers, and we deserve to be able to ask questions, both on taboo subjects such as ufology or what we're talking about tonight, which is 9-11, re-examining, taking a step back, 
in a, as you can tell from this conversation with Dwayne, a level head. And we were just discussing thermite. So, Dwayne, take it from here and talk to us about what thermite is, what applications it's been used for in the past, and third part to this question, was thermite introduced into the 9-11 Commission report at all? Okay, uh, the thermite, if I can emphasize the nanothermite, there was thermite there, which is a more conventional uh, accelerant is the term that's used, that's used for cutting through metal, lowering the temperature so it cuts through metal like a knife. Uh, whereas this nanothermite, which is a much, uh, much uh, smaller, you can think of, of nanothermite as being a, as small as the width of a human hair or, or smaller. Okay. It's very definitely engineered. It's not a natural thing. And it has got to be engineered in a very sophisticated laboratory with very knowledgeable uh, people to know how to do this. Uh, it shouldn't have been at the World Trade Center. There's no, there's no practical uh, reason for no why it should be there. Reason. Right. Uh, I was starting to say before the break that it contains its own oxidizer as part of a little, think of it as just a tiny little package. And by having its own oxidizer, that, ex, that explains why these extraordinary temperatures persisted for weeks upon end, uh, even though they were beneath the ground. Well, who found the thermite? Who was the one? I had heard about a professor being laid off uh, because professor of this. Professor Stephen Jones, okay. at BYU at the time. It was Brigham Young, correct? Brigham Young University. Mm -hmm. uh, he actually uh, was forced to take an early retirement, same thing as being fired. Sure. And it was because of this. So I'm It's quite sure that uh, BYU got pressured. But how, how did he find out? How did he find out? Well, yeah. Uh, I really can't go into the details on okay. that. Uh, okay, fair enough. But you know. basically, that goes into one of the questions I had, which I think a lot of people had. It seems as though when this happened, like I said, there was a rush to judgment. Some of it I can even understand because that's a politician's job, which is to find out who this person is, find the demon, find the evil, the axis of the evil, and go after them and get vengeance, right? Right instead of having a level head and trying to find out what really actually happened. But what I found was amazing was the cleanup. It seems like it was swift and it was constructed in a fashion where we didn't see a lot of it on the news. We saw plenty of the buildings going down. We didn't see anything about the actual cleanup. Where did all this debris go, Dwayne? The, the debris was taken out of there uh, under high security. Even people that were interested for scientific reasons to look at the at the remains, the remnants of the buildings, uh, basically were not allowed to look at them. Maybe they were given a few sample pieces, and and so there basically is no evidence in the way of of remnants of the steel and things you'd want to examine. Right. There's nothing left. So uh, you really should have viewed this whole thing as a crime scene, and you protect the evidence. Of course. It was not viewed as a crime scene. It was reviewed. Uh, it was viewed as a terrorist-caused uh, event, and all of the rules about evidence and protecting that were just thrown out, ignored. Now, before we leave thermite, I just want to stress the fact that thermite. I have read and seen things from, especially your coalition here, that thermite can be actually put into things like paint and used as an application device in all kinds of resources. Can you describe what I'm talking about here? Yeah, that would be the nanothermite. I always like to make that distinction. Okay. The nanothermite uh, can be uh, put into a salt gel, which uh, can be applied as you would apply paint. It could be sprayed on. Uh, in fact, workers could have been spraying on nanothermite without realizing it. Wow. thinking they were spraying on insulation or something. So basically there was no explanation for why thermite was present, correct, from the 9-11? That's right. In fact, if you uh, just talk about that part of it, the 9-11 Commission never acknowledged that there was any of this, either the high temperatures 
or any any kind of explosives at all. Uh, now the 9/11 Commission had its final report issued before the uh, research report on the nanothermite came out, so there is a timing difference. However, NIST was still working on its final report when that that research report in the this is a peer-reviewed paper in the open literature, mm-hmm. but NIST never acknowledged that that paper even existed. They they basically stonewalled the uh, the evidence of the nanothermite as well as the extremely high temperatures. They never admitted that that was true as well. Now, do you how many people are involved in your coalition right now? Well, there are uh, going on thirteen hundred architects and engineers. Okay, and out of the 1,300, these are people that some of which, like Gage, who started it, are uh, members of the American Association of Architects, correct? American Institute of Architects. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And other prestigious people in general. Uh, In my opinion, that's tough because basically they have made this subject, as far as I'm concerned, They've made you almost un-American for supporting a reinvestigation or asking questions about this. There seems to have been a a, a pretty good PR campaign about doing that. If you remember very well the Bill Clinton clip where he's all red in the face going, how dare you? Exactly. How dare you? He's such a great actor, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. How dare you? But uh, while he's lying to the American people, how dare you? But Yeah. there he is doing that and others. And I guess my question, it seems as though, just like ufology, which we talk a lot about on this show, it's a taboo subject. So I can understand from a political perspective, and I, I would imagine you agree, this is a political suicide mission for any person of the Senate or Congress to get involved with, correct? Well, I'm sure it is in the fact that there's not a single member of Congress or the Senate that is asking for a new investigation. They all stay away from that subject. Yeah, it's it's absolutely unbelievable. Not to mention, let's just bring up the, the commission real quick. I know we're trying to stick to the actual engineering, but the commission, from an engineering perspective, let's go there. What was wrong with it? Well, one thing is they did not bring forth a lot of evidence and uh, testimony that went to them. Uh, much of it just never showed up in their report. So they were very, let's say, picky and choosy on what they sh- chose to include. Right. And uh, what about the. Let's, let's just take Building 7. Okay. Not one sentence in their final report, the 9 11 Commission, mentions, I shouldn't say mentions, it, there is a mention of Building 7, but only as a reference point that someone was standing by Building 7. There's not one word about a collapse of Building 7. How many people lost their lives in Building 7? Well, officially, the answer is zero. Okay. Uh, there are two witnesses that were involved in uh, the early hours of Building 7 after it was supposedly vacated. One of those, his name is Barry Jennings, uh, his testimony was that there were explosions in the building, even prior to the the collapse of the nearest tower, World Trade Center number one. So his testimony was in conflict with the official story. Uh, he, uh, uh, unfortunately, is uh, no longer with us. Okay. He died for unexplained causes one week before the final report was issued. Wow. Wow. So 9-11 Commission, again, neutrality, impartial, being impartial, getting an outside body that doesn't have any political affiliation. Would that have been smarter, in your opinion? And also, transparency. You were able to watch every single second of the OJ trial. You were able to watch every single second of the BP oil Senate hearings where they all looked like heroes for bashing Tony Hayward while they were probably taking money from half of these guys for their political campaigns. Um, You were also able to watch every second of Roger Clemens demanding that he didn't take HGH, which is so compelling and important to this country's well-being. But 
9-11, I don't recall being able to see anything about this investigation except a big old book at the end of the day. Am I wrong here? Uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, maybe if you got on C-SPAN, you could have watched the hearings, but the mainstream media really didn't cover it. Why? Well, I mean, I, I have to ask, why isn't the mainstream media bringing any of this information, not not just the 9-11 Commission? Yeah. But uh, you haven't seen Building 7 no. come down on the mainstream media, other than the first hour and maybe hour and a half after it happened on 9-11. But uh, something just ended up suppressing all that, and it hasn't shown up. I'm yet. telling you, Dwayne, I, I mentioned Building 7 to people, and they go, what's that? 90% 90, 90 of the time. Um, which is very strange to me. Like I said, we're talking about a very large building. In Portland, it would, I think, I believe it would be the largest building in downtown Metro. Okay? This is totally unprecedented. And then you have demolition experts. And one of them I'm going to bring up when we break here uh, in a few, because I want to have some ample time to discuss him. But how many affiliations... How much expertise do you need to have to be taken seriously in this country is something that really is important to think about. I guess at this point, you have to think to yourself, where is this going? And is it ever going to get taken in a new light because the evidence is gone? What do you think about that, Dwayne? How are these people going to get a new investigation? And keep in mind, the people who are upset, listeners, the people who want new investigation are not only people like Dwayne, not only these genius-level engineers and architects, but also the families. The families are the most important people who lost somebody, and they say, this is not enough. We want the actual data. We want a real investigation. There were people that left the commission, correct? That's right. Tell us about it. Uh, the one uh, senator, former senator, Max Cleland uh, basically would not put up with it. He, he basically felt like they were set up to fail, and he resigned. Would have nothing to do with it. Since that retirement, is he a member of any of these coalitions? Has he decided to just take a step back? I think and they managed move to move him aside. He's, uh, he's got some sort of a position that is not, not all that important. Interesting. He was moved aside. So let's say I had to sit you down, and again, I don't want to get tonight into who did this. What would be the most impressive piece of evidence if you had to talk to somebody on the fence here that they didn't know about? And I think it's Building 7 myself. I think it's Building 7. Not only that, but there are things within the building that I wanted to ask you about. What was inside Building 7? I think it plays a factor. Yes, uh but let me just preface that by saying the thing about Building 7 is it's so clean. It's not confused by the plane striking it. Right. And so it's just a pure building out there that suddenly comes collapsing down. Uh, and that's why I think it's so important so you don't have all that confusion factor. Absolutely. I mean, here's the point, and we're going to break after this because I want to talk to you about Jesse Ventura. Yeah. Um, People can go online and watch demolition. Well, oh, oops, that was a slip. People can go online and look at Building 7 coming down. And if you look at this in comparison to other controlled demolitions, I could be wrong here, but I don't think I am. They look exactly the same, correct? They do, absolutely exactly the same. Okay, when we come back, I want to talk to you about Jesse Ventura. I want to wrap up Building 7, and then I want to get across to people how and where they can go to view information, because to me, video is very important in 9-11 and the reinvestigation. So when we come back, let's do that. You're listening to Euphonaut Radio. This is Jesse Randolph, KPAM 860. Don't go anywhere. Back now with Dwayne Dietz talking about 9-11 how we can do something different, how we can re-examine something that obviously needs further investigation by the experts, not conspiracy crazies, my friends. 
you can hang on to that one as much as you want. And I will say this too, Dwayne. You know, I'm a New Yorker native, and I'm sitting in a Met game. My cousin would hit me if he was sitting next to me. He's a very straight-laced guy. He's a terrific guy. He works down on Wall Street. I believe he was supposed to be in one of the trade towers when one of them came down. I think he had a dental appointment or something. Either it was in the tower or right next to it. The point being is I'm sitting at a Met game with him having a hot dog a couple of years ago, and I brought up, just hinted to the fact that perhaps the, the official story wasn't on the level or it wasn't exactly transparent enough, et cetera, et cetera. He got very upset, and he did not want to even look at something like that. He didn't want to even think about it. And I think that happens with a lot of these kind of issues. It's, it's much better to move on. We've found the villain, and now we can just move on and have these parades and have the bagpipes and have the politicians with the solemn handshakes and the hugs. You understand what I mean? Right, yeah. And so I think that's where we're at with this. And, again, they've done a terrific job of making you seem like some sort of un-American conspiracy nutcase. How dare you for questioning? And I guess what I want to do is bring up Ventura because he deserves it. Jesse Ventura has been blasted for wanting more answers on 9-11. Now, keep in mind, here's a guy who is a demolitions expert. He was a Navy SEAL demolition expert, okay? He's an ex-governor. I mean, how high on the food chain, Dwayne, do you need to be to have a valid opinion that deserves some attention? Yeah, that the fact that he was a demolition expert, I think, should carry a lot of weight, but it seems to just get brushed off. It does, and I've seen this gentleman... He's not afraid to go on shows. Obviously, he has his own program. In fact, I'll probably reach out to him sometime in the future because I'm waiting for him to do his UFO investigation on his reality show. Huh. And I'm hoping that he does one because he's the kind of guy that I need to try to get some answers to this because there are so many whistleblowers. Now, here's a common question I get from many people. And again, folks, the show's almost at its conclusion. If I missed your call, I apologize. It was more important to get a lot of this information out, but I might be able to slip one in. 877-774-5726. That's 877-774-5726 if you want to call in. Um, A lot of people say to me this. If 9-11 had any sort of conspiratory aspects to it, there would be people, there would be whistleblowers, There would be too many people that needed to be involved, whether you believe it was an inside job, outside job. Again, we're not pointing fingers to who. But even if it was, it couldn't have just been. It had to be hundreds of people involved. And because no one has come forward, therefore, that can't be the case. What would you say to that? Well, I do hear that as an argument on why not to dig into it. Mm -hmm. And... uh, we really don't know how many people would be in the know. I think a lot of people were involved, and they just didn't know what the bigger picture was. They were doing what they were told to do. So I think you really really end up with a uh, very tight-knit, small number of people. Uh, you also don't have people coming forward if they, know about, if they knew something about it, because uh, they would be uh, basically confessing for mass murder or involvement in it so there's a uh, sure some good reasons to not come forward if you actually did know something about well and we just explained if there's nano thermite in your paint and you're a construction person and you're doing some paint work how would you know right you wouldn't know so you're a willing party to a issue or a problem or a conspiracy whatever you want to call it but you have no knowledge of being, you are almost cut out of the know, and which does happen in even plenty of NASA pro, uh, projects, right, in the compartmentalization of information, correct? Oh, that's right. And you basically only know what you have a need to know. Exactly. The yeah. need uh, to know, yeah. which ticks me off to high hell because I have a need to know. Who am I? I'm Joe Nobody that lives in the suburbs here outside of Portland, Oregon. Uh, they don't really think I have a need to know, but I do. And there's a lot of people within the, the new guard here that listen to this program that have a need to know. So let's do this. The show's 
coming to an end here. What I want to do is empower the audience. So, Dwayne, two questions. Number one, what is the most impressive lecture or documentary someone can view right now if they're on the fence about 9-11 as far as from your perspective, from an engineering, from a structural? Which documentary has the most quality messengers? Because keep in mind, I could have brought on all kinds of crazies on this program tonight if you're listening to this. I had people talking about scalar weaponry, laser technology, uh, holographic technology, all kinds of crazy, dumb stuff, in my opinion. I came to you for a specific reason, because if you have quality messengers that are safe and sane, speaking things that make sense, people are more open-minded to it. So where can people go to see something visually? Well, I, I really do think the best one to look at is from architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth. Mm -hmm. And uh, the the DVD that's called Blueprint for Truth, 9-11 Blueprint for Truth, which is Richard Gage's presentation, if you get the compact edition or companion edition, I guess it's called, there are three different time. Uh, you can choose to watch the 30-minute version okay. if you want or the hour version. Oh, you so can, there's they're actually the minutes. edited. Pick correctly. whichever you've got the time for. Okay. And uh, so I'd recommend you do that because I think they've really packaged into those time periods uh, the oh, critical information. I agree with you. And how do, how do they go there? What's the web address? The web address is ae911truth.org. Yeah, and see, that's the amazing part. We're not speaking to someone. I, ha I have authors on here all the time. I have people selling all kinds of products. These people are not doing that. They are just trying to get to the bottom of something that obviously doesn't make sense. And if you look at who is involved and you watch this video, it's just like when I tell people, if I can sit you down with a few of the James Fox recent documentaries, I know what I saw and such, and show you some of the ex-military or defense contractor people that are saying explicitly and directly what they were involved with, putting it on the line, if you don't want to look at the truth, that's your problem. If you're afraid to handle it, I get it. But don't say it doesn't exist. Dwayne Dietz, you, to me, are part of what is considered the American dream and what we stand for, for asking questions and being a part of this. So I thank you today for being on the program. And I know you had a very busy day. So thank right. you so much, sir. Well, thank you. I enjoyed being on the program. Thank you. Take care. Everyone else, I hope you learned something. I hope you do your own investigation. Until next time, next Saturday, 9 o'clock p.m., this is Euphonaut Radio with Jesse Randolph. We'll see you next Saturday. Evidence, possibly, and some hypothetical theories for reopening a case that should have been transparent in totality, but was definitely not. Building 7. Does it ring a bell? Building 7. Many don't even know what Building 7 was. Well, tonight, I want to talk about Building 7, the significance it plays in this homage to the people that lost their lives on this day from my hometown and around the country, 9-11. Asking questions about 9-11 has become taboo in this country, much like ufology. You are a crackpot. You are un-American. By asking questions, please don't be intimidated to ask questions. Demand answers. Our country is based on these principles. When we stop and become afraid to speak out or inquire, we have surely changed paths. 9-11 is still very much a mystery. So the important people involved, the families, the loved ones, they are not satisfied with the investigation, hence, it should be reexamined by an actual qualified and uninfluenced political body. So, tonight, we are joined by one of the men, one of the men that I... There are astronauts, and there are euphonauts. Warning, the following material may not be suitable for all audiences. Please listen responsibly. Welcome, everyone, to Euphonaut Radio, 9 to 10, every Saturday night. 
Broadcasting live here from the mothership, Cape Ham 860. I'm your host, Jesse Randolph. And as always, thank you for tuning in tonight to a program that takes you on a truth journey outside the matrix every week. You fin out radio, what do we do here? We report the latest happenings within ufology, paranormal, new science, and we examine these subjects and their communities with a very high level of scrutiny together. With that being said, please put your cell on vibrate. Open your mind while we present the taboo to you that most are afraid to discuss openly during the work week. If you sense a seriousness to my voice, and if that's apparent to you, it should be. Tonight's show, as most of you know, is the ninth anniversary of the 9-11 attacks. I didn't realize at the time we had a show planned on 9-11, but fate so have it, we do. So many people are still very angry. They're hurt. Don't speak of. We had two ready for you. We have one here tonight. We don't need to ask for Senate hearings, my friends. We can let them stick to Roger Clemens and HGH. They're too busy. Instead, what we're going to do is let this gentleman educate us tonight and empower us on where to find more information. UFNOT Radio is privileged to be joined tonight by former NASA Flight Research Program Manager and a member of the AE 9-11 Truth Initiative, Mr. Dwayne Dietz as we dedicate this show to the families of the lost ones on 9-11 tonight. And we will not be afraid to ask the tough questions on their behalf. Dang tweets coming up after the break. This is Yukonaut Radio, KPAM 860. Don't go anywhere. 9 to 10 every Saturday night. Yukonaut Radio with Jesse Randolph on KPAM 860. Okay, let's get into it here. We forego the news with Sandy Fleming to have more time with our guest because this is oh so important. Mr. Da- Mr. Dwayne Dietz, excuse me, I'm a little sensitive tonight, a retired aerospace research engineer. While at NASA Dryden Flight Research Center, he held positions of Chief Research Engineering Division Director for Aeronautical Projects. And like I said, was confounded by how this could ever have happened. So much so, many needed to take a step back and analyze. Unfortunately, it seemed at the time that our leaders were more interested in swift judgment and what I consider, as many do, an unorganized and eventually admitted false accusation and accusations which led us down roads to warfare that proved to be of no connection whatsoever to what happened on 9-11. Tonight, we will not focus on the who. I'm telling you that right now. What I wanted to do was bring you a fresh perspective on why this subject still needs further review and investigation. I didn't want to go into the conspiracy zone here. Analogy. You want to buy a used car. You take the car to a mechanic to check it out. Makes sense, right? You want to purchase a home. You have an inspector. Check out the place beforehand. Make sense? Tonight, I'm going to bring you an expert in the field of architecture and engineering that has come to the conclusion about what happened structurally in New York that do not resemble at all what the 9-11 Commission talks about. What I really want to focus the hour tonight on is what I feel is some potential smoking guns, a flight research program manager. Dwayne, welcome to the program. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you. I know you have a long day, and we're going to hear about that, but I want to jump right into some things here as we only have an hour together. So why don't you start by telling us a bit about your engineering background, but more about how you decided and why you decided to get involved with this subject, probably knowing full well that it was not something that would further both your career or your reputation by any means? Well, actually, I retired before uh, 9-11 happened, Mm -hmm. the year before that. And I didn't really uh, become alarmed and suspicious. I kind of bought the official story at first. And long about 2006 is when I uh, really had serious doubts 
from my professional experience in aeronautics, I became uh, very suspicious about these novice pilots that supposedly flew very difficult tasks and striking the two towers. That I thought that was very difficult even for an experienced pilot mm -hmm. to pull off. And, uh, and so I just got curious and looked into it. And uh, the more I looked, I just I saw that there was just one 